Welcome along to the Property Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Ian McKnight. And today on the show, we have a very special guest, Mr. Tony Alexander, who is an independent economist. Welcome back to the show, Tony. Nice, guys. And today, we're going to be talking about the property market and house prices, but only over the short term, the next less than five years. Now, Tony, my first question for you is, when are we going to get to the bottom of the property market? When are we going to see it? Oh, yeah, I think within the next six to nine months, in that you know some of the key factors which have been concerning the buyers, I can see easing off over the next few, uh, few months. And this is one of the reasons I do these uh, five monthly surveys. And the one I do of the real estate agents gives very valuable insight. You know, I ask, uh, uh, are you seeing FOMO on the part of buyers and a whole lot of other questions? And I ask, what are the main concerns the buyers have? And so 82% of the agents say, or oh, their main concern is a rising interest rates. Well, of course, they edged back a bit already, the interest rates. So that's interesting, and I expect them to keep falling, but at a very slow pace. We've also got about 78% of them saying, oh, their main concern is lack of access to finance. Well, I can see in at least three of my surveys there that finance availability is improving. The banks are becoming more willing to lend. So that concern is going to get taken care of. The one remaining one there, this is a tricky one, is the FOOP, the fear of overpaying. Mm. 69% of the real estate agents say may huge concern of the buyers is that they buy and then the price falls a little bit further. So who wants to buy and then the price goes down for the same house next door and you might start laughing at you. <laughs> so that's one reason why in my commentaries now I'm emphasising to first home buyers what is it that's most important to you? Taking advantage of a doubling of the number of listings from a year ago vendors becoming more willing to negotiate and getting a home in which to raise your family or eking out the last five percent in the house price cycle it should be the first thing yeah. quite quite frankly and so I think anyway these three concerns will be dissipating more and more over the next uh, few months so six months or so yeah which is an interesting point uh, because obviously when we're working with investors all the time so many of them do want to pick the bottom of the market which I completely get but you don't know the bottom of the market until it's already been. And so, you know, some investors I was just talking to before we, we started recording, um, they that that was kind of one of their things. I thought, well, right now you've got a, you're in a position where you've got double incomes. You might have another kid in the future which is going to stop you being able to borrow money. You're mad if you pause to wait for that bottom that bottom of that market rather than just take advantage of the good rather than thinking about the bad because there's always negatives and positives in any market, right? Yep, no, most definitely. And yeah, we economists, we know from you know decades of experience, we can't pick the top, we can't pick the bottom. You can only pick it out in hindsight, yep. you know, as, as you say. And I know from myself, my own experience in buying property, I, I mean, I haven't been an investor. Oh, I, I have a number of properties, but they're all been for family reasons. Um, I've never given any thought at all to where the property cycle was actually at when I made a purchase, apart from the first one back in September 1987, <laughs> when I was 100% gripped by FOMO. <laughs> That's why I ask about FOMO, because... I, I, I had no deposit and bought this place and of course then there was a share market crash four weeks later. And isn't that funny, so, so probably one of the greatest minds of economics in New Zealand um, doesn't doesn't actually take these things into consideration because you would probably talk yourself out of every deal, you'd be the worst investor to work with ever. You can always look for a reason <laughs> not to invest, not yeah. to take a, a step forward but you know, to put it in perspective I don't think a single person young person looking at buying, investing or whatever has ever heard their parents or grandparents say, I bought my first house in 1982 for $68,000 but I've always regretted that I should have waited three months and I could have got it for 67100 yeah, yeah. It's completely meaningless yeah, if yeah. you miss the bottom of the cycle Absolutely. when you take a long enough time period. Now it's interesting that you should say that you reckon the bottom of the market's going to be six to nine months away so we're probably talking at what February to March whereas the Reserve Bank initially Three months ago in the, later, in the May monetary policy statement, they had property prices bottoming out in, I think it was about March 2024. Now, in the most recent monetary policy statement, they've brought that back six months. They're now saying September 2023. You're about three to six months ahead of them. Why do you reckon we might hit the bottom before what they're suggesting? Yeah, I think because those concerns I can see out there dissipating of the interest rates uh, uh, levels, and that's one reason in the previous podcast I kept saying, the average one-year fixed mortgage rate for the uh, 2010 to 2020 was a 5.1%. And you look at the rates on offer at the moment and go, 
Well, actually, that's not really all that high at 4.95% or so. People are going to start getting uh, less fearful of what interest rates are doing. So that's going to uh, feed through. I think we're going to, in the next few months, get a point of capitulation by the vendors. And that, if anybody is trying to pick the bottom of the cycle, this is one of the classic things you look for. When the sellers of the asset go, that's it, I'm meeting the market. Got to get on with my, my life. And I think we're getting close to that point for many of the vendors out there. And I think that that's certainly the case with people like... Like developers at the moment because developers are running a business so someone that's selling their own house can afford to ride it out or if it's a, a rental property you know we'll just rent it out for another 12 months and wait for kind of things to get a bit easier but if you're a developer and that's how you make your money you have to meet the market pretty quickly yep yep you've got to keep the turnover you've got to keep the cash yep. flow coming in because the bank is certainly going to <laughs> demand it the banks themselves at the moment really won't have any great worries about the individual who's purchased a house even a negative equity situation the labor market is so extremely tight and that's where this period of challenge for the economy is completely different from anything I can you know, previously uh, you know, recall in the past of, of downturns. When we look at the New Zealand's 08 recession and then the GFC at the end of it, the unemployment rate within about 18 months rose 3% or so from 34 to 6.5%. This time around, you'll be lucky from the 3.3% we've got at the moment if you get yourself much above 4.5%. Mm. Good job security means banks are going to go, oh, this person's still going to be able to service their mortgage. So you know, mortgage sales are really not going to be any great phenomena this time around. But in the development sector... That's where the challenge Absolutely. lies. Absolutely, yeah, it's a different kettle of fish. Now, one of the things we were talking about just before we hit record that I just want to point out for all of the listeners at home is we were talking about the differences in data quality. So, for all of you data nerds out here, we're about to oh, get nerdy. God, I'll leave you two to it, shall I? <laughs> but what we were discussing is that while the Reserve Bank might make their forecasts and predictions based on whatever macroeconomic data comes out, Tony, you're looking at a different type of data in terms of your surveys that you've kind of created. I wonder if you could give some comments on that. Yeah, I've got these five monthly surveys. Most of them were started up during the first lockdown in uh, you know 2020 uh, when I had the number of people subscribing to my weekly jump in seven weeks from 2,000 to 10,000. And I thought, right, I'm going to mine their knowledge. And what I'm looking for then is people's broad feelings about what, what they're seeing in the economy. Am I thinking I'm going to spend more or spend less in my, my spending plan survey from the real estate agents? Are you detecting FOMO? And is the FOMO changing there on the part? of the buyers? Have you got more or fewer people showing up in open homes and auctions? A lot of these measures just simply aren't out there. I'm the only person in the country with a measure of FOMO and of FOOP, the fear of overpaying. So I'm looking for early indications of the market turning, of strength dissipating, and that's why, you know, over a year ago I was saying um, we've entered the end game for this boom in the property market. I could see some of that showing up in, in some of those uh, surveys there. So yeah, it is a unique uh, data set. I doubt very much the Reserve Bank or Treasury are feeding any of the time series into any of the models <laughs> that they've got there. The, the, the length of time they've been out there, you know, is simply is not, not long enough. But it can give some insight and bring perspective. And so that's why in some of the surveys I ask the respondents to make a comment about what they're seeing out there. And then people can look at that and go, yeah, I'm seeing the same thing. It's not me out by my, my own just having this feeling about what the market is doing. And I try and reprint those on a regional basis as well because we get, you know, different different things in different regions around the country. How are we going to know when we've actually hit the bottom of the market, Tony? Oh, I think in my surveys we'll be, <laughs> ab we'll be able, to, able to see it. Yep. Uh, so that's one thing. It'll take a while for it to show up in the likes of the REINZ's uh, official data, the house price indexes, um, etc. Uh, so it'll, have, it'll be anecdotal. It'll be yep. anecdotal very first of all from the real estate agents out there. You see, I only survey them every four weeks to get right at the coalface. There's a risk they'll be seeing it, you know, two to three weeks before I can gather up the information. So when real estate agents start buying houses, that's when you start to buy, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe that's one, one sign. But there's all different groups that are looking to buy out there. Obviously, we've got some first home buyers hoping to pick the bottom. But then you have the group that I, I, I don't think I really capture them. But by crikey, if I could, that'd be useful. It's the investors who are professionals, who've got good sized portfolios. They've been around for decades, if not generations. And they know you start your buying before you reach the bottom, because that's when the vendors are most willing to capitulate. The stock available is the greatest. And I reckon one or two of them have already started. Uh, we, we could probably actually provide you something. I actually wrote down on my on my notes uh, here, we yeah. need to start surveys. Uh, well, obviously not, 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 not your surveys, but with those uh, exact investors. So yeah. I'm noticing, so I've got two properties under contract right now. I'm noticing a lot of my older investors coming back saying, 
where are the deals? Because that n- next year, I think what we're going to see is, um, regardless of what the market does, developers, if you're buying off plans, are going to say, you know what, we can't afford to do this. We're just going to mothball that. So there's not going to be that same supply. Yep. And so all of a sudden, the deals just don't exist. Yep, but the transition is important. You see, before we get to the uh, situation of there's not enough supply coming forward, we've got something I predicted over a year ago that around about this time, there would be a focus on there's an oversupply. Yes. Shortages don't exist. That ball has still yet to get rolling, and that will place some extra downward pressure on prices heading yes. into the new year. And that's where you see why I'm, I'm not saying, oh, I think the bottom is two to three months yep. away. That ball has got to get ro- is going to get rolling a little bit more, as well as net migration outflows brain drain mm. we've still got a few months of us Kiwis wallowing in those negatives before mm. the market market turns around but yep. like I say the skilled long term investors they'll look to take advantage yep. well it's interesting that you should bring up the oversupply of houses given that literally two hours ago logged on to Radio New Zealand RNZ um, and see there that Kiwi Bank is talking about in 12 months there'll be an oversupply of houses <laughs> which I must admit gave me a little bit of a chuckle sitting here now but I wanted to get to something you just mentioned you said the deals are going to be there before we hit the bottom of the market I wonder if you could dig into that a little more okay I don't know if I've gone into saying anything serious there it's more before just after at the bottom the uh, skilled investors won't try and pick the bottom just like they wouldn't have you know, tried to pick the top. So I don't know in terms of the best deals. I mean, personally, I think the best deals are probably coming out of the development sector where some of the developers, yep. the banks are going to press them and they've simply got to get some extra sales, quite frankly. Yes. I don't think the best deals are necessarily going to be on the existing stock of properties um, um, out there. But yeah, I, I, I don't really think I'm sort of saying in terms of timing necessarily sure. where the best deals would a, be. A little bit off topic, but just you, David can edit it out if he doesn't want to in here afterwards have you noticed or have any any sorry in any of your surveys have you noticed any panic selling from people that are really finding it hard after the interest deductibility rules have come in zero zero evidence of panic selling zero evidence of any wave of investors doing the selling I mean the fall in interest rates has obviously helped them out a lot in terms of the uh, the, the cash flow there uh, if they were looking at selling and I remember talking a lot about this or um, 18 months or, or so mm. ago what are you going to do sell the property which has gone up on average by 7% per annum since 1992 uh, uh, put it in the bank earn uh, I think I used to use uh, uh, 2% take off tax take off inflation you're going back what at the moment, 5% or yeah, something, yeah, yeah. it simply didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So all that's happened as a result of the March 23 announcement uh, on the tax changes of last year is not a wave of selling, it's the investors as buyers have stood back. That was immediate, yes. and it, it is still there, the investors are standing back. But now, of course, you've got some political opinion polls suggesting maybe National win the election next year, and so investors anticipating, therefore, they would enact their policy of back to two years bright line, restoring uh, deductibility of interest expense. Some investors are going to start some buying ahead of the election and Absolutely. on the potential of a change. And this is where it kind of separates the wheat from the chaff, the people that actually maybe our experienced investors go, right, let's get in here now because everyone else is sitting on the sideline. Yep, yep. Now that's the thing. There was a comment um, uh, just early on about uh, oversupply, etc. Um, I think when it comes to the likes of the big cities, no. There'll be a perception up in Auckland of, my goodness, who's going to buy all these townhouses? But you know, underlying the population growth is going to come back for Auckland. It'll it'll eventually return for a lot of the Wellington region um, and, and Christchurch, of course, as, as well. It's, it's got its own affordability dynamic. If I was to be dragged into an argument of there's going to be an oversupply, it would be in some of the regions yes. where we've had a population flow out of some of the cities over the past two years, maybe people retiring earlier than they planned, and at the same time as they were shifting to the regions looking to buy a house, the councils all of a sudden had to prove where the land was going to come from for uh, residential construction, uh, not for 10 years, but for the next 30 so just about for every part of the country, except maybe the west coast of the South Island, the council is having to say, we do not have enough land zoned mm. residential for population growth projected in the next 30 years. And I think maybe in some parts of the country, they have got ahead of themselves, but n- in my opinion, not the cities. So your advice to first home buyers before was to take advantage of the doubling of listings, the 10% drop in house prices. What do you think for property investors, though, who are planning out a long term strategy? 
Well, you, you stay with the long term, basically, and over the long term, these fluctuations up and down, just like in the share markets, get completely lost um, in the wash. You recognise that one component of the fluctuation is the rental market eventually eases up, and we can definitely see that with slowing rental increases, rents decreasing in the likes of Wellington and Auckland. You know, So there can be a cash flow impact along the way because that can happen with your financing costs going up for a while. But you keep the long term focus, and in one of my surveys there, just about every month I've got 65 to 68% of people saying um, I'm going to hold my property at least 10 years or I plan never to sell it. It just hardly changes Mm. over time. So for those with a long-term focus, you will know that whether you buy three months before the bottom of the cycle or or just after, it really doesn't matter as long as you know why you're buying the property, uh, uh, how the changes you can make to it. You've had a look maybe at population projections. Are there any major transport networks going in nearby? You look at that sort of thing. So Tony, again without your crystal ball, do you think we'll see any growth in Auckland and Christchurch say over the next few years? Oh, most definitely. I yep. mean, definitely uh, extra weakness in prices at the moment, far less in Christchurch uh, than there is like in, in, in Auckland and, and certainly Wellington City. Um, but my expectation is broadly over 2023, you'll get something like maybe a 5% average increase in prices. Obviously, the uncertainties are still through the roof. Yep. But when I'm looking at the feedback I'm getting from my surveys, when I'm looking at the interest rates really not being all that stressful when you compare with the past three to four uh, decades, <laughs> um, and when you look at sort of of you know, underlying population growth eventually uh, are returning. And of course, rising construction costs, there's only one direction they're going over time as well. It leaves me with an expectation broadly calendar 23, up maybe 5% and maybe a little bit more over 2024 as well. And if I forced you to invest somewhere, where would it be? Oh, where would it, where would it be? <laughs> if I forced Tony Alexander to actually sign a contract and buy an investment property for it without putting his kids in it, where would it be? Be careful, he might pull out a contract on you. Uh, yeah, that's right, so we got a deal for you. Yeah, okay. So I'll be looking for a long-term yeah. focus. I'll be looking somewhere where I expect you know good population growth, and I do still see that for Christchurch over the long term. Good affordability, um, etc. Are uh, down here. I might not be averse to a punt in Auckland CBD when there's the most crime and drugs and head bashing oh. on the street there. You might have a little bit of a look there with the tourists coming back, etc. But I think I would probably have a look somewhere, maybe maybe even north of Hamilton. With the population growth for the next hundred years, it's going to be Auckland, uh, Hamilton, that sort of you know 120 kilometres uh, uh, along there, and maybe I'd have a look at one of the smaller towns, you know, located uh, in the expressway network, uh, frankly, between Auckland and Hamilton, because there's going to be some strong population grow- grow- so, growth. So there. potentially Auckland, Hamilton, and Christchurch. Can someone bring me three contracts down from downstairs? <laughs> <laughs> right, let's wrap it up there. But please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the Property Academy podcast. Really does help us get the message out to more people. And hey, what I want you to do is go to Tony Alexander. .nz, sign up for Tony's View. Andrew and I both read it. Uh, I get it. I print off two copies, one for me, one for Andrew, because he can't can't figure out how the printer works himself. Um, it's going to be really good for you guys to get that regular understanding of the economy. I got it right. There's not co in there. There's not it? no co. It's just Tony Alexander dot nz. Tony Alexander dot nz. Sign up for uh, Tony's View or for the premium publication. Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Knight. And we're going to be back again tomorrow with even more daily strategies, tactics, and insights to help you get the most. Until next time.